I just had the bloating and the uh, uncomfortable um, pain in my stomach. And that went away in 30 days, which was kind of amazing. But I also had a history of anxiety and depression. And <laughs> it was so bad in my teens that I got kicked out of my parents' house before I even graduated high school. So I was mentally a mess. But through the course of the next year, that was kind of the big aha for me. It was nice to not have digestive issues, but when I finally felt stable and um, hopeful and inspired, that was the bigger change. And that happened probably over the, the course of the next year. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Today we have uh, special guest Autumn Smith is here. Thank you very much. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, where are you located? Remind me where you're at. I'm in Boulder, Colorado. You're in Boulder. Okay. I, I played rugby in Boulder. I remember years ago. <laughs> I used to live in, I used to live in, Chey I used to live in Cheyenne. And so we, I would, I would come down and play for the Denver Barbarians and we would sometimes play against the team in Boulder. And then uh, there was a carnivore conference in Boulder that uh, Amber O'Hearn put on a couple of years ago. So I was there, I think, I think it's been about three, four or five, maybe four years ago. Really neat place. Tell us a little bit about yourself for those people who aren't familiar. I know you were, you're associated with the Paleo Valley, if I'm not mistaken, but uh, give us a little get a little background rundown on what, what you do and who you are. Okay, yeah, my name is Autumn Smith, and I am a co-founder of Paleo Valley and Wild Pastures, and we also have a burger restaurant here called Wild Pastures Burger Company that we started. And I got into this basically because I was always into fitness and health, and I was a dancer, but my stomach always hurt, and I had IBS for 15 years. And no doctor could treat it, but it was when my husband and I got married and he saw how bad I was suffering that he said, we're going to fix this. We're going to just kind of take the reins. And he, we tried a paleo diet back in 2007 and it transformed my health physically, emotionally. And uh, we got so excited about it that um, we wanted to provide the physical products that made this lifestyle realistic because I was still working as a, a fitness trainer for Tracy Anderson and I was traveling around a lot. And I found it really difficult to maintain the lifestyle uh, at that time, especially. So we got into products and started meeting a lot of really wonderful farmers. And um, here we are. That's interesting. You know, IBS, which, you know, some people have heard of, not everybody has, but I mean, it's, it's really affects a lot of people. I think if you look at the stats in the U.S., it's somewhere between 15 to 20 percent of the U.S. population is now diagnosed formally with, with IBS, which is amazing and there's probably a lot of people subclinically that don't know they have it that have it. if you look at i think i read somewhere like even mexico the diagnosis even goes up to maybe as high as 40 percent of the population and so clearly there's something in the diet that, that that is affecting that and you know as you figured out by removing whatever it was and replacing it with better food that 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 seems to help and uh it's very interesting and i and i too went to, i went on a paleo diet at some point you know as i think it was about 10 years ago i was doing that as i kind of made my little journey into nutrition and stuff. So how did, uh, so you, you founded the Paleo Valley company to sort of deal with the issue you've been having. And tell us the wild pastures, I think is a different uh, sort of venture. And that's, tell me more about that one. Yeah. So wild pastures has kind of happened after my son Maverick was born and we started developing these relationships with farmers and ranchers who were using methods that kind of went beyond organic. They were teaching us about regenerative agriculture and why it was important and the fact that we only had 60 years of topsoil left, according to certain statistics. And basically that the farmers wanted to farm in, rege in a regenerative way, but they didn't know how to find a demand for it. And we realized, well, wow, this is quite a huge mission. And if we could connect the consumers who value this type of meat and agriculture to the farmers who are doing the really awesome work and are actually the heroes in the equation, then we could potentially move the needle for them because my husband uh, specializes in marketing. And so we just decided to be that middleman and to not only be the middleman, but also keep the cost as low as possible because we wanted there to be enough volume to actually move the needle and favorably impact the environment, uh, which we desperately need today. Yeah, it's an interesting problem because, you know, the economy is a scale allow you to operate at a, at a you, know, at a, you know, you can you can come down to a price point where people can meet you. And the problem is getting there and, and you know, the marketing part of it and figuring out how to do that. Because I think most people, given the opportunity, would say, yeah, I'd rather my meat was farmed this particular way, but I just you know, the realities of my, my first personal finance situation don't allow for that. And I, I just bought a local cow and it wasn't, it was relatively the same as I, I spend in the supermarket. It wasn't much different. You know, you know, the, the difference being 
you get the whole cow and you don't, you don't sort of get to pick and choose the cuts you might want, whereas you're getting, you know, uh, you know, but, but I mean, besides that point, um, when you, uh, started this sort of, I guess the marketing side was just kind of what I'm interested in because I, I, you know, I think these, these farmers and ranchers, God bless them. They do this hard, incredible work. They feed us and they, and they get no thanks. Literally. I mean, they, they get there. It's a thankless job and they still do it because I think many of them just love what they do and they love maybe the, it's hard work, but they, they, t- they tend to do that. And I always, every time I get a chance, whenever I talk to a rancher or somebody that's feeding me, I'm like, dude, man, thank you. <laughs> thank you for what yeah. you do. But they don't have, they don't have time to market. I mean, they re- I mean, many of them, many of them there. I mean, you know, most of you know, as you know, most ranchers in the U S 95% of them are mom and pop family owned 50 head of cattle or less. You know, there's a few large ones, but the majority of them, these smaller people, and they, they, they just don't have time to spend all day on the internet marketing their wares and so how do you think and i I see some of them i mean some of them are getting out there and and, and spreading the news about agriculture and thankfully they're doing it but i think we have to see one thing that frustrates me is why there's not a national campaign from guys like ncba or uh that have the money that they could do these marketing campaigns but yet they choose to not do that for whatever reason i'm not sure maybe i'm Maybe I'm just being critical and don't know all the details, but how do you mark, how do you, what do you think is the effective way to get to the, get this information out there? I mean, obviously you're here. I mean, this is part of it, right? But I mean, what, what do you got to do? Yeah, basically what we do is kind of just test the, the uh, words and the verbiage and the images and, you know, just the language around this issue that resonates most with people. And then we do podcasts, actually podcasts and meeting people through their own audience is a really, really effective way to help people understand the importance. And also we've found that using actual images of the farmers is very effective because then you get to see the wonderful people who are actually raising your meat. And so that's kind of been what we've been doing is basically focusing on um, Facebook ads and some YouTube ads and image ads. But it's it's an uphill battle because it's always changing. Uh, The game's always changing, as you might imagine. But we are just so uh, driven by the method or by um, our mission that uh, we just keep uh, pivoting when and if necessary. Yeah, what message is resonating? I mean, there's certain messages that have sort of the that are kind of sticky that they stick people they get. And, you know, I I can make scientific arguments all day long, but it puts people to sleep and it's boring. They don't understand it. It's too complicated. (laughs) And so you try to just get this viscerally. I mean, this is what, you know, quite quite honestly, vegans are very good at. They show some picture of some poor animal being mistreated. And they're like, oh, my God, this is this is how all your animals are treated. And it's just, as you know, it's total nonsense. But what sort of messages are you finding seems to, to be moving the needle on the side that, hey, eating animal products is not bad. It's not bad for the environment. It's, it's actually good for us and, and we should continue to do it and do it in the best way possible. But what is, what is the message you find at work? Yeah, that's such a good question because I like the detail and I've read all the studies and, you know, it's just, it's too much for mainstream a lot of times. And what we found to be the most effective is grass fed. People just want to know that it's grass fed. And so uh, we've also done a lot of ads where, I talk about the recent research where they're looking at carbon sequestration and comparing it to, you know, like Beyond Burger and Impossible Burger, which one study showed or actually um, data shows about four pounds of carbon into the atmosphere for every pound they produce. Whereas when you have regeneratively raised beef, at least from Bluffton, Georgia at White Oak Pastures, you're going to sequester about 3.5 pounds of carbon. So it's it's kind of letting them see that, yes, you know, vegetarian proteins might be better than conventional proteins in terms of their ability to impact the environment, carbon specifically, but that doesn't mean they're better than all types of meat production. So that message has been really helpful. But when it comes to just like a one-liner, people just want to know their their meat is grass-fed more than knowing um, all of the other details that I want to share and overshare. Yeah, and I've, I've had the opportunity to uh, interview Will a couple of times, Will Harris, as you know, for the proprietor yeah. of, uh, you know, out at uh, White Oaks Pasture. and. Um, I think one of the problems that, that, you know, and again, it comes into nuance, you know, just you can put grass fed on the label and it doesn't really mean that much, you know, it's because, you know, the animal could be actually, you know, they could actually be more destructive to the, to the environment because if you don't manage them well, I mean, you get this problem with the deforestation or the, yeah, I mean, the des- desertification, like Alan Savory likes to talk about, where you just have animals willy nilly just munching the, the, the grass down to dirt and so that becomes a problem. And so I think there's, you know, as you probably, I, I'm sure you're doing it, you just got to, further educate the people that not all grass-fed beef is is the same and so i don't think we stop with just grass-fed when we're talking about an environmental message but uh i think and and there's a lot of nuances there's a health message there's a 
Uh, I obviously am a big proponent of meat as a health food, as you probably are aware. Um, what, uh, how long has Paleo Valley been in, been in, in, in existence? What does its trajectory look like? Are we growing? Are we, are we seeing more customers? Are you seeing this message starting to, 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 to make progress? Yeah. And I just want to say on what you just said, I created this seven part docu-series to break down all those. Here's the labeling lies that we're working with. And you veg is a vegetarian diet and a vegan diet better. And why do we need protein in the history of meat? So you're right. We do need more education and we're definitely working on that um, as we speak. But Paleo Valley, the trajectory is good. We've been growing significantly and we started in 2008. And oh, I'm no, I'm sorry. When I got off a tour in 2012, we started. Um, and yeah, every year we're growing and we're just adding more and more products. And we're especially going more the meat direction because we realize that's what people are really liking. We never intended to be a big beef stick company, but that's our number one selling products. And so we're going into chicken and to pork sticks and to, you know, we're looking at salmon jerky. And of course we just whole animal utilization. So looking into creating our own bone broth and um, of course only supporting regenerative farms. And we're going into superfood bars. And then we're going to just kind of meet the demand of other products that people have been asking us for and things like a kid's line. And, you know, our big thing is, you know, regenerative agriculture. We want our products to be as good for the environment as they are for human health synergy. So we do a lot of whole food and then really, really high quality products, always organic or hundred percent grass fed, regeneratively raised and then accessibility. So of course, keeping the costs down, we don't want these to be boutique products that people can't afford, but yeah, we're growing uh, lots of employees um, being added. And so we're feeling good. Good for you guys. And I've, got, and I've got some Paleo Valley beef sticks in my pantry that I occasionally have. I mostly give them to my kids. I, I tend not to snack that much, but my kids have put it in their lunchbox and they 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 really enjoy those things. So it's a good good little product for people. Um, one of the things, you know, I often, you know, kind of was thinking about, you know, where am I, where I'm going to end up? And someday I'm like, I dream that someday I have my own steakhouse or something like that. And one of the things I was doing, in addition to the menu, you give these people educational material uh, even studies, you know, say, hey, like, you know, here's a study that shows beef is good for you. And just because I think the cons the average consumer is just inundated with the, the the sort of the nonstop propaganda hearing, oh, beef is bad for you. Beef is destroying the planet constantly, constantly, constantly. So somebody has to counter it. And I mean, I can't do, you know, as much as I try, I'm one small guy in a giant world here. And uh, even though we're slowly making progress, but I would, I'd love to see uh, companies, restaurants, people that sell beef is to educate people. And, and, and as part of their, just here to ship a study with your, with your product and say, here, here's the latest study on this. And so, so people get educated and I know some people read it, some people don't, but I think we just have a really, a truly uninformed population. Um, so you guys are in Boulder is, is, is your entire facility, all your cows and cattle in, in that Boulder area, where do you, where do you guys source from typically? No, what we do is we work with co-ops and people around the country. There's farms in Indiana and in Missouri and in Nevada and Idaho and um, Wyoming. And so we just work with people who we really trust a lot of times through the American Grass-Fed Association, and they kind of manage their co-ops according to their um, their standards, of course. And then they just ship the meat to us. We have warehouses throughout the country. We have warehouses in Phoenix and in um, Southern California. And we have one in Denver and we have one in Wisconsin. And we're looking now at Atlanta because we just got to be nationwide. And then the restaurant venture is specifically in Boulder. And I love that you say that you want us to integrate uh, education because that's exactly what we're trying to do. Create videos and pamphlets. And, and the whole docuseries was just kind of about that. But we do hope to take the burger chain nationwide too, because we cook the fries in tallow. You know, it's all regeneratively raised beef. We have gluten-free options. The produce is organic. There's no sugar in the whole, whole store, which I've, it was actually quite difficult, but um, we're just trying to meet Americans where they want with their demand for fast food, um, but also really high quality fast food. That's just not going to wreck your metabolism. So like I said, we hope to be um, opening further locations really soon, but that just got opened um, right after the pandemic. So it's coming along. Yeah, it's, it's been tough for everybody with this pandemic kind of craziness. It's, I, I think I, J, Dr. Jeff Gerber, who's from Denver, he said, he, he, he basically summarized as the pandemic has just sucked overall for everybody, which I think is, oh. is a fair statement. I don't think anybody would disagree with that, regardless of what your view is on it. it clearly, everybody thinks it sucked. 
Um, are you guys into box beef? I thought I was. I'm, you were. Uh, you were maybe at one point you were talking about box beef. Are you selling cuts of meat, cuts of steak, and beef to people as well? Yeah, that's wild pastures. So okay. Paleo Valley is more of the snack side of things, and then wild pastures is just where we connect the regenerative farmers to the consumers. And then you get to kind of customize your box. You can do 20 pound, 30 pound boxes, um, whatever you want. We have fish, you know, beef, chicken, and pork. And then it just shows up on your doorstep. Um, a lot of times where we're set up and we have warehouses, it's going to be delivered to you by our delivery people in recyclable packaging. You know, we're looking at solar powered facilities. We're just trying to take the environment uh, into consideration in every single aspect of the business, but we are nationwide for that one. We just got nationwide for wild pastures. And so, yeah, you can order cuts of meat or you can order snacks or burgers. What is the, uh, what, what is the climate right, right, right now? I mean, obviously, you know, our, our company, we're looking at, we're in the healthcare sector and we're looking at, uh, you know, you, I mean, I, you know, not being vegan, you know, I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't think that's the right answer. I think you need a whole food diet and, and meat is part of that. And, and for many people, a majority, if not all of that, for certain conditions, at least that's been my experience. Have you found that the landscape for expanding a meat business is favorable, unfavorable? Was everybody saying, well, beef is dead and we're going to be eating uh, uh, bug burgers and soy slop? I mean, I, I know I'm being biased here, but what is has, has it been a pretty positive experience in expanding the, to this market? Well, it's interesting because in Boulder, you know, we couldn't find a people to rent to us at first uh, with our burger concept idea, because there's a lot of veganism and vegetarianism right. here. Uh, we finally did because pandemic helped us there. They needed people, they needed tenants. And so that worked for us. But, but also when we ask people why they unsubscribe um, to our service, being I'm, I've decided to become a vegan is a very popular response. And that is exactly why I felt it necessary to create the docuseries. I thought, you know what, I haven't done a good enough job educating our audience if that's still how they feel. But despite that, the, the positive thing is we're still growing, right? And people are still wanting this service. And so I think there are enough people who, you know, are not going to give up meat and might be open to a better type of meat. And I think that, you know, more environmentally friendly type of meat kind of meets people who might be on the fence about it. Uh, and so that's what we found. We do have some resistance, but we're going to educate and try and push through just like you're doing. Um, but we're still growing. So we're very, very hopeful that this <laughs> this isn't over, <laughs> that we will finally convince people that meat is just it's been around for two million years. It cannot possibly be the reason that we're sick now. No, it's clearly not. I mean, anybody, no. anybody that has a half of you know, two neuron synapses that are connected <laughs> together, we'll, we'll be able to figure that out. But we're, you know, we're being sold a different story. And it's kind of interesting. I saw Somebody sent me things that Google Trends, you know, meat based carnivore diet is running up the trends and it's, it surpassed vegan diet and it's passing all these other diets. And then somebody from Google actually contacted me and says, you know, that's not our official data. And I said, well, what does your official data actually show? And she says, well, um, Google is very anti meat. They're very pro vegan. <laughs> is that, mm -hmm. Literally, an employee from Google told me that. And it's just like interesting uh, that they're doing that. And then the message disappeared because they put it on vanish mode because they didn't want me to copy that and, and get that information out there, but it's going to get out there anyway, because we know they're biased on that. And so you have to fight against that stuff. Do you see any, I mean, and one of the issues that I've pointed out, and it's not a secret, I mean, Congress is looking at this, you know, many ranchers are aware of this. There's a problem with our meat system in the U.S. that is monopolized or, or, mm. or an oligopoly of four companies, basically, or five, if you count the Smithfield for the pork side. But, um, do you have to operate within that framework or are you, I, I mean, I know the USDA processing facilities are kind of, it's kind of a choke point or, or how does that work? Or do you, do you get into that part? Yeah, no, I do. I get, I get into that part because that's my husband's role in our company. And um, fortunately we have uh, fostered some really wonderful relationships with processors and we're currently in the process of purchasing a processing facility that would allow us to prevent that bottleneck because you're 100% correct. When we had coronavirus and the pandemic outbreaks, um, all of the people, the middle range like us, were pushed out because those other processors had to come up and take our space. And so, yeah, we're going to have to get into processing, but we're willing to do it because that's what it's going to take. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but a processor is not a not a small venture. It's a pretty big price, big, 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 big high dollar item. And, but I mean, I think if you if you can get that going, ultimately it'll pay pay for itself. I assume. I mean, I guess that's the calculation why you do it. I imagine. 
Oh, hundred percent. Yes. It's been something we've been looking at for the last few years. It's just become a reality more recently financially. So yeah, it's, it's just part of something that it, it's what we have to do, but we are going to do it. What are your, what are your top selling items on the, on the paleo Valley side and the, in the, in the, I mean, I guess that's probably more because every beef is anyway, I think the wild pasture side, it's, it probably speaks for itself, but the paleo Valley side, people, you said the beef sticks or what, what are, what are people going after? Yeah, basically the beef stick. So they're just a fermented beef stick raised from regeneratively uh, raised beef. And then we also have turkey sticks. So pastured poultry and chicken, it's really hard to find done well. Um, we've done that. And then we just add spices and we ferment them so you can avoid all preservatives. So those are our best selling product. And I think more relevant to your audience would be our organ complex too. We started making organs. We're really into whole animal utilization, right? And um, they're nutrient powerhouses, as I'm sure that your audience is very aware. So we do heart, liver, and kidney in capsules. So you don't have to eat it if you're someone who doesn't like to. And then our bone broth protein powder is also really popular. We have a food-based vitamin C that's really, really popular. Um, an apple cider vinegar complex, which is more of our kind of digestive support supplement. And then our superfood bars. I don't know if your audience would like them, but they do have a collagen protein and they're relatively low carbohydrate. Um, so maybe, maybe not for them, but they are our best sellers too. Let me ask you the difference between your bar and say like a slim gym, you know, you remember back in the day, I was eating a snap into a slim gym. You know, he had one uh, was a pro wrestler, macho man, savage ripping into the slim gyms. I think that's who it was. <laughs> What's the difference between like the standard thing you're going to get in a gas station and yours? I mean, how do they, how do they do that? And you mentioned fermentation and stuff, but what are the major yeah. differences? Yeah. First will be flavor, right? So a slim gym is like, it's hard. It's tough. It's chewy. Um, ours because of the fermentation product it's or process, it's a little bit moist. It has a snap, but it's like, it's kind of like more like a kielbasa or like a hickory smoked summer sausage. So the flavor is amazing. Right. And it's very different, but then sourcing, obviously slim gym, I can't confirm this, but I'm sure it's not sourced from a generously raised farm. And, uh, you know, that's polluting the planet. So ours is only regeneratively raised. And then also slim gyms are going to have your MSG or your sugar or your gluten or just other additives or, um, hydrogenated oils made with citric acid. And so we use the fermentation process, um, to avoid any of those preservatives and stabilizers. And then we don't add anything, any flavor enhancers like MSG or gluten or anything, because when it's a really high quality ingredient, like grass fed beef from generative raised farms, we just had to or, um, add organic spices and it's, it's absolutely delicious. So it's basically quality sourcing, um, what we're adding or not adding the way that we preserve it and the flavor very different. Yeah, I wonder uh, two two th two requests. I guess uh, yeah. I don't know if you guys ever think about making pemmican, or or if you think about making uh, biltong, which is another product that is kind of popularized in Southern Africa, particularly South Africa, which is a really really if it's done well. I've had some really bad biltong for some reason. A lot of the companies, it's just not the same. And if you've ever had traditional real stuff from Africa, it's like it's it's mind bogglingly really good. I had some in Dubai. I was there a couple of weeks ago, and I actually had some that was authentic. So just a suggestion. I don't know if you guys, that's on your radar. But it is. It <laughs> is. And I think we've tried a few samples yeah. that we were kind of not happy with yet, but yeah. we will persevere. And I love that suggestion. I think yeah. It's good. yeah. I know the pemmican all, cause a lot of people, you know, I get a lot of guys that are like military and they're trying to do a carnivore diet and they're like, Hey man, I'm gonna be out in the field or I'm going to go hunting for a 12 day backpack trip or something. What can I bring? What can I bring? And, you know, you can make it on your own. I mean, I've made my own pemmican and stuff, but it's just, a, it's probably more work than I'm willing to do. Quite honestly, I'm kind of lazy. I hate to admit that. I'm, at least I'm lazy, about, I'm lazy about certain things. I'm not lazy about some things, but but for sure. Um, where, uh, where, what is the demographic of your market? I'm sure you looked at that. Are we getting moms? Are we getting hunters? Or who, who are the people that are buying this stuff? Yeah, you know what? It's primarily moms. It's primarily over 30 to, you know, up to 50. It's, it's, it's actually pretty even for men and women, but a, a lot of moms and a lot of um, travelers, hunters, those are our main demographic fitness enthusiasts, wellness buffs. But yeah, I think moms drive the market a lot of times and it's definitely a huge percentage for us too. Yeah. that I mean, if you look at the research, moms make the nutritional decisions in the household, you know, so you got to reach those guys or those gals, I should say. But um, <laughs> yeah. do you guys have any, um, any thoughts to, I mean, a lot of we get, you know, and again, it depends on budget and, and, and that type of stuff, but you see a lot of like celebrities, you know, pushing, uh, 
uh, Coca Cola and just garbage, you know, the Beyond Meats and stuff like that. Are you? Is there is there a thought that hey, maybe we can get somebody on board to sort of like an athlete, you know? Because you think about it, I, I just I just amazed that we don't have more athletes sponsored by the meat industry or meat companies or, or things like that because it's it's most of them eat it. I mean, it's most it's it's part of their diet in most cases. Yeah, no, absolutely, and we do have. We have sponsored some UFC fighters and hopefully that will continue to snowball. And right now we're using a lot of micro influencers because it's actually working really well for us. But I think the end game, like you said, is getting more of the celebrity status on on board. Um, and so we, we definitely hope to go. And, and like you said, athletes too. Yeah, that is definitely something we have in mind. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting because I get it's surprising a lot of people that are uh you know fairly well known that are now they contact me about the carnivore diet and they're on it on the down low they're they're kind yeah. of because they're you know i i had a i i'll, I'll use his name just because i don't think i care bear gorillas who's a fame you know pretty relative pretty relatively famous survivalist outdoor guy and he i, I talked to him on the phone yesterday he was talking to me about he's been on it for a year and loving it and feels great and wanted to ask me some questions about stuff but so we we do see that, that that I think there's people out there, but they're just a little gun shy because they're going to be they're afraid they're going to be labeled as some greedy evil person that's destroying the planet. And I think that narrative has to be has to be oh. just trounced. And 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 I think doing what we're doing and educating people is a big part of that, you know. And I think it's I, I'm glad that you're you're willing to do that. And you know, I have a company that that is based around that. What are the biggest struggles you face as as doing this? I mean, it's easy, you know, there's an easy, there's a, there's a path of least resistance, and many people choose to go the the other routes because it's just it's easier, you know, it's less uh, there's less cost involved. But what are the biggest troubles or problems you you see as you scale up and do what you do? Yeah, if the big problem is trying to maintain the integrity of the ingredients, right? Because people supply chain is a mess right now. Uh, due to the pandemic. And so we have the option of kind of downgrading and cutting corners or just making people wait. And we've decided that just integrity is kind of the most important element of our company. And so we often make people wait, but we add them to a waiting list and we just let them know this is what's happening. But like, uh, like that, the reason for that, like I said, is because the supply chain is in such disarray right now. And so exactly what we were talking about earlier, we're looking to become vertically integrated and to just have a, a stake in all of the steps through our process. Um, we eventually acquired our beef stick manufacturer and processing plant is next so that we can just be doing this all under our own arm umbrella, be our own priority, and then not have to make people wait anymore. But Definitely having high standards can be a liability sometimes, but it isn't something we're willing to compromise on either. We just have to be creative about the way we find solutions for it. Yeah. And one of the things you often see with, with a lot of companies, they become successful, they get some brand recognition and then they get acquired, you know, Kellogg's buys them or PepsiCo or something. And then, you know, I think, you know, I'd like a Primal Kitchen, Mark Sisson's product, you know, I think he yep. got bought out by can't remember who bought them out for like two hundred million dollars, Nestle or something like that. And so we really, I mean, you know, in the world we have, I think it's like ten, nine or ten companies that control all of the food supply, and the little guys like you know, you guys are kind of like, <laughs> it's kind of tough, you know, because you know, you know, the second they buy you out, the first thing you know they're going to do is they're going to cut corners. They're going to say, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to do, yeah, we can save it. We can, you know, we can knock five percent off our cost of goods sold if we skimp on this, and it is unfortunate. So it's kind of a tough thing, you know. I, I can see where. You know, somebody says, "Hey, here's you know, here's here's five hundred million dollars. You know, go, go away, go away." And then you know, and and but but I don't know. I, who knows what'll happen down the road? Um, where? Uh, so let me ask you because you said you used to be a dan a dancer. I mean, was it ballet or what kind of dancing were you doing? Yeah, well, I grew up and I was trained by some principals of Bolshoi Ballet, and so I was a ballerina. And then I went to college. I did modern dance, and then I moved to Los Angeles and did some dancing for like a Disney artist. And um, but I worked for Tracy Anderson as a kind of like a fitness based dance trainer. I don't know if you're familiar with Tracy. I'm Anderson. not. I'm, I don't do a lot of fitness based dancing, so I, it's not my wheelhouse. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, she's like the celebrity fitness trainer who right. hires dancers because of the relationship that, that they have with their bodies. And then, um, so basically, yeah, that was the job that I was doing when I had paleo change my life. Cause I was really fit, but not well. 
And so um, it was just, it was, I thought that was such an important distinction that we decided to create a company around it. How are your feet? That's one of the things with ballet dancers. <laughs> Actually, believe it or not, in the orthopedic surgery literature, there's, there's, there's entire chapters written on ballet feet because there's, there's just these... <laughs> you know, path, you know, you're on point and you've got these stresses that are not, not usual. So do you have any lasting feet issues or anything like that? Not lasting, but I do have calluses everywhere. <laughs> I had bunions forever. Uh, yeah. My feet are not one of my best features, uh, but that's okay. I actually prefer them to have the calluses because I can walk on things without uh, shoes on. So, but nothing structural or anything that causes any sort of damage. I still dance every single day. Um, and it's still a big part of my life. So I got lucky that way. Good for you. And dancing's fun. I was, I, I was, I, somebody sent me a video of these little kids from Africa and they were hosting, they're doing a happy meat dance. They were, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really interesting uh, site. And they have these kids that are just kind of talking about poverty, but they were coming up and they were got, they got some grilled meat and they were just dancing and it was really cool to see. But, um, yeah. talk about, you know, you had, um, IBS and I don't know what else is going on. How, how has the diet impacted you? Like, fix everything or, or where are you at with that? Yeah. It's so funny because it was 30 days and I had, you know, I just had the bloating and the uh, uncomfortable um, pain in my stomach and that went away in 30 days, which was kind of amazing. But I also had a history of anxiety and depression and <laughs> it was so bad in my teens that I got kicked out of my parents' house before I even graduated high school. So I was mentally a mess, but through the course of the next year, that was kind of the big aha for me. It was nice to not have digestive issues, but when I finally felt stable and, um, hopeful and inspired, that was the bigger change. And that happened probably over the, the course of the next year. I think I grew up and as a ballerina, you know, I was taught to eat lettuce and to smoke cigarettes. And I think I was severely malnourished and I don't think I had enough animal products on board. And, um, I think having a nutrient dense diet that actually prioritized meat was a huge, huge part of my recovery. And that's why uh, we started with the meat sticks actually. Yeah. But yeah, today I have no symptoms. It's interesting because yeah. you do see a lot, a lot of pressure on particularly young women that, you know, to be super thin and, you know, there's a backlash where now we want to just, they're glorifying being super obese. And I think that's not the right answer either. I think something in the middle and probably a little bit of functional muscle and lean, lean mission, lean mass would be a better way to go. But um, you know, when you sit there and you're, you know, you're trying to be for about, I didn't know smoking was a big component of ballerinas. I guess it makes sense. You're trying to be thin and that's that, that traditionally is associated with that. Did you grow up around like animals? Did you come from like a farming community or town or were you, how did, you know, or it, so you did when you were a kid? Yeah. You know what? I grew up in Montana yeah. and a lot of my friends were ranchers and farmers. And it's funny because uh, at the time, even when I went into this business, I'd go home to Montana and they'd be like, Oh, this grass fed stuff. This does this is just, this is not going to go anywhere. Like stop with all of this. But now I have a lot of my rancher friends calling me and asking how they can go about transitioning their operations, which is, which is really, really exciting. So I did grow up around it, but it was, you know, more of a conventional type of agriculture. Yeah. What are, you know, I guess for the people, because most people haven't grown up around, unless you come from, you know, I mean, these days, I mean, most people are living on the coast, you know, if you look at population density and either suburban or urban. So rural life is, is, is not a much of a reality for most people. What are the biggest sort of misconceptions that people have about ranching and farming and, and that you can speak to maybe because uh, I, I, you know, I, I get people, it's just almost comical. I mean, they're, they're like, well, I, I, my eggs, my eggs don't come from chickens. They come from the store or something like, you know, you hear this sort of nonsense, but <laughs> it's kind of, yeah, I guess that, um, the biggest misconceptions, I mean, we've talked about, it, I'm sure you talked about it, that, that it, it can harm the environment or that it is inevitably going to harm the environment. And obviously there are well, well-documented ways that that's not true. The other one is, I think that, we're just so disconnected, right? And we think that the death of an animal is something that we can ultimately determine by not purchasing the products. And it's just growing up in a community like that, you see that it's just part of life. It's just a cycle and we need to be grateful. But even when we opt out of meat consumption, animals are still dying when we're raising plants. You know, it's just, you can't have a garden without some sort of animal inputs. It's just the system doesn't work that way. And so I think 
believing that we can really opt out and have the environment thrive despite that or to kind of cheat death. I think that's a major misconception. And then also that it, it inevitably has to destroy the environment is actually the solution to our environmental woes in terms of water and biodiversity and carbon sequestration when it's done in a way that um, is thoughtful and is highly managed and kind of merges those traditional practices with um, modern technology. How many, I mean, because obviously, you know, Will Harris had his study done and he, I think General Mills paid for that study, if I'm not mistaken, and it's probably not cheap to do. Are there any other, other, other ranchers or do you guys have any aspirations to say, look, these are our, our, our suppliers and we can demonstrate unequivocally that we're putting soil back into the ground, we're putting carbon back in the ground. Is that, is that being done by anybody else? Yes. I love that question. So, um, our ranchers are a lot of times working with American grass fed association. And then the savory Institute has their ecological outcome verified program, their EOV program. And so that will be something they'll move into. They've been looking at carbon credits overall right now. It doesn't seem like that makes a lot of sense, but, but also what's really interesting is, um, I just got an email yesterday from Dr. Van Vliet. I don't know. Are you familiar with him? Yeah, Stefan, I've interviewed him. Yeah, I know. I know him. Okay, okay, great. Yeah. So I'm just finishing my doctorate and I need to do a dissertation and I wanted to do it around something that would demonstrate the human health benefits of regeneratively raised meat. And so we're going to try and um, collaborate so that um, we can look at 10 days of a crossover trial. So someone eats conventionally raised meat for 10 days, and then they come over and do, you know, a regeneratively raised piece of meat. And then we'll look at markers of inflammation, uh, interleukin-6 and CRP and all of those things so that we can, again, not only demonstrate the uh, ecological outcomes, um, but also kind of further the conversation around the distinction between conventionally raised and regeneratively raised beef. Yeah, I, I, I applaud you guys for doing that because I've been I've been de- bemoaning the fact that those studies aren't out there. There's almost nothing on humans, and I mean there was a study A and M did a few years back on ground beef grass fed versus grain fish. They looked at some markers. There wasn't much difference there. There's a study. At Australia, looking at kangaroo meat versus conventional raised beef, which doesn't that doesn't make sense. It's kangaroo, versus it's a totally different animal. So, I I really hope you do it. And, and when you guys do that, regardless of what the results are, I'd love to share that with you, with the audience because I think we need to get them. Because I'm at this point, I like say you know I think meat is healthy for anybody, regardless of the source right now, um, relative to processed food, and we should eat what we can afford. But I can't go further than that because there's no data yet. And if, if you guys do get the data that says, hey, yeah, look, there's a big difference in uh, inflammatory markers. And then, you know, if, if we can somehow sort of show a clinical outcome, that'd be even better uh, eventually. But uh, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see that because then I, then I can at least say with more confidence that there's a better reason to do this. I, I agree on the, on the, uh, on the, uh, the uh, you know, I've interviewed, you know, Bobby Gill from Savory and, and of course I've talked with Alan about the, you know, the verification of the ecological, ecological outcome verification system. Uh, that's clear and to me, I mean, at least to my knowledge. And even though I've talked to people that, interesting, I, I interviewed a guy named Max Winders, who I think is a very nice, intelligent guy, and I think he's got a good argument. But it's, it's, it's nuanced, and I mean, I think there's, you know, you know for people that want to do a little better, this is, this is a good way to go. So when is that study going to be done, do you think? Or has it been has it been proposed or funded well, you know, yet? You know what? It's really cool because um, I'll probably try and figure it out in the summer. But Dr. Van Vliet and I are getting on the phone next uh, Thursday because it's funny you mentioned the kangaroo trial because when I wrote my one page summary for my dissertation proposal, it was simply the kangaroo trial with beef, right. beef versus beef, right? Uh, so he said he's actually running that trial already, and then he just wants to kind of bring me in. So I don't know the timeline yet, but I'll find out soon. But I do know that he's also working on a longer trial where he looks at not only like, you know, single meals of regeneratively raised beef, but what happens when every single thing that you eat in the course of a year is regeneratively raised and what happens um, when you don't, you know, when you eat a more conventionally raised diet. So I do know that data is coming, but that's a that's a huge undertaking. And so right. that will probably be a few years. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be happy to see that being done because I think it's something that desperately needs to be done because this conversation, you know, it's it's not only just a conversation of, you know, should we go to an all plant-based diet, which I think is a complete, absolute disaster for the people <laughs> that support that. Uh, but then it's talking about, you know, how can we do this? Now, you you mentioned the people that you source your meat from. You mentioned, I think, Idaho and Montana and Wyoming and uh, Indiana. And I can't can't remember a few others. 
are they having any, I mean, you know, it gets cold there, you know, it's it cold, it's cold. It's no, you know, you live in Montana. I was in Montana in February and it was 22 below zero. I was in big sky. I was freezing my butt off, but it's, so how do we sort of, you know, I mean, cause people, the critics of this will say, well, if you live in the Shenandoah Valley where, where, uh, uh, Joel Saladin lives, you got beautiful green lush stuff pretty much year round, uh, with rare exception. But now if I live in Northern friggin' North Dakota, or Alberta, Canada. I don't have I don't have lush green pastures year round. How do you how do we make a regenerative? Uh, uh, and I know you're not the rancher, but any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, I'm not really the rancher, and that would be a question more for our uh, manager. But I do know that when it comes to our products, they, you know, they ha- find creative solutions, and they're only fed grass or anything that is within the spirit of regenerative agriculture uh, as much as possible. Um, actually only, they will, they will only do that. And sometimes it tastes a little different, right? Uh, and so the product kind of varies dependent upon the season and dependent upon it, where it comes from, but they do kind of adhere the letter of the law. I'm not exactly sure what they're doing on each specific farm. Uh, but I do know that they are very committed to the, uh, the spirit of the regenerative agricultural practices. Yeah. One thing, and I've had a lot of grass finished beef and some of it, some of it's delicious and great and wonderful. And some of it's not, you know, it's just kind of like, and I think there's, yeah. uh, people are learning still. And I, I can't remember who I talked to, but it said, we're trying to, we're now starting to figure this stuff out. Whereas, you know, you just, I'm just going to throw my, my animal out on grass and let them munch down and, and then, you know, not pay attention. But I know guys like uh, Glenn Elzinga, which I don't know if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with him. He's at Alder Spring Ranch in, in, in Idaho. And he, uh, he's up in the, in the, in the sort of the, the, the foothills and the mountains and his cows graze, you know, regeneratively for sure, but they're, they're eating flowers and all kinds of stuff. And it, it really imparts a flavor. And he's literally walking behind them eating or sampling what they're eating and, can tell how it's going to affect the meat flavor. And it's kind of interesting to do that. It's a, it's fascinating because in other countries, they really uh, revere certain types of animal products because of the area that it came from. They're kind of tied to that landscape through the flavors of what that animal is eating. And we don't really have that here yet in America, but I, I hope through our education and just uh, people becoming more and more passionate about it, like your audience is that uh, we'll get there. I do think we will. Yeah, because we you're right. Very, I mean, from Arizona is a very different thing than from Missouri. Yeah. Sure. You see it like in like, uh, you know, like in Italy with the pork, you know, prosciutto di Parma or, you know, in Spain, the Mom Serrana, you know, these different areas and regions where they're known for what they feed their animals, which is kind of a, kind of an interesting thing. Um, where, um, you know, as far as, I guess you guys, I'm sure you guys are on social media. I, I should probably follow you guys there. Are you finding, are you getting any negativity? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I get a lot just because I, I tend to call out vegans and, I, and I, don't, I don't have any problem doing that. The funny thing is, you know, when they look at it and they're like, well, you know, and some, some of the other doctors, will, they'll say, well, you know, you should, you should be, you should act more professional. And I'm like, well, I don't have a PETA. I don't have people making these ridiculous arguments and putting out this nonsense propaganda. So I got to do it myself. You know, it's kind of like, you know, why, why, why isn't NCBA or somebody like that putting out some goofy, funny commercials and I mean, I, I could, I could literally write the commercials for them. I've, I've got, but anyway, are you getting much blowback or is it mostly all positive on, on, on the Paleo Valley side? No, I got, you know, I do the ads a lot of times and I had to stop looking at the comments because the vegan population is out for us for sure. And they are vicious. So no, we get a lot of, um, a lot of pushback and a lot of negativity, but I always just like to remind myself that we're just going against the mainstream narrative and it's just going to take a while and uh, hopefully people will learn and be nicer, but no, we are absolutely getting so much opposition that um, some days when I was reading those comments, it made me want to stop, but we we will, we won't do it because I realize this is happening to all of us and um, it's a really important message. We'll have to send the carnivore army in to to do battle. (laughs) (laughs) Yes. Watch our Paleo Valley ads. And we, you know, a lot of times now we hide that negativity because some of the things they would say are just so vulgar and so offensive. Yeah. I mean, I wish your kids were slaughtered and yeah, I mean, and they get not nasty stuff, but it's interesting because, you know, um, regenerative agriculture, they really want to go after hard because, uh, yeah. they, because people are looking at like the average person looking at it, say, wait, I could do that. I mean, that makes sense to me. It would, it would, it would fulfill my ethical dilemmas and I feel like it's delete meat and it's, it, it, it would make me feel better about what I'm doing from an ethical standpoint for those people. That's a consideration. And they see that as, you know, as a, as a, as a, uh, strong, 
hold for 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 meat consumption. So they're going after it really hard. You're seeing them saying that, you know, all this anti-regenerative ag- agriculture propaganda. It's just kind of funny to see that. You know, you'd, you'd figure that. You know, if you look at to it, and you're looking if you're if the ethos of veganism is to do le- do the least harm and produce the least suffering. Uh, and not many, because you know, it's never going to be zero. And even I think some of them, even the most brainwashed vegan will realize animals die. But to say that, you know, look, I can raise an animal. There's no pesticides, no herbicides. One animal is going to provide a whole lot of, uh, you know, a big animal like a cow is going to provide a whole lot of nutrition for a long period of time, contrasted to crop, you know, monocrop agriculture, which, you know, they always try to say, well, the cows are eating all that. Well, no. It's like 36% of the cereal crops and all they're not eating all the tomatoes and strawberries. I mean, they might eat a few leftover parts, but um, it's crazy. I mean, that, that they do that. And, and I don't know. I mean, how do you guys, uh, uh, do you guys ever, you probably just block and delete these clowns, I would imagine, right? <laughs> I do because I don't have the bandwidth yet, but I mean, maybe we'll do something a little bit different and just educate. My goal is like this, my just once my dissertation is done. I'll just go full throttle on educate, 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 and push back. So eventually, yeah, I think I will be more um, forthcoming and just address their comments in a intelligent and organized way. But for the time being, yeah, we just don't have time for people who are going to be dogmatic and don't, you know, don't really care what we're trying to do or don't understand our intention. But honestly, there have been people who are grateful and who transition because of this option. And so I do think it matters. There's going to be some people whose minds will never change and they'll always be obnoxious. But but I, we do find a fair amount of the other other camp as well. Yeah. And I, and I look at people and, and this isn't exactly what you do, but there's, there's a guy named Van, Dan Van Tyker of interviews, Iowa dairy farmer and some other ones. And they just I mean, they literally like, look, I'm here standing in front of cows and this is what they do and they're not being tortured and they're not being, you know, it's just literally showing what their life is actually like. And so this is the reality. And and, and because most, like I said, most people have never been to uh, a, a cattle ranch or a dairy farm or any of those types of things. And so they're absolutely clueless. And so, you know, like I said, if, if you can encourage your producers, you know, because a lot of times you'll get this, this crazy comment and, and, you know, some of the social media allow you to respond to the comments, which I'm just figuring out how to do that. And you just kind of like, okay, here's your cra- crazy comment and here's the reality. And, here, and I can, sh- I can back it up because I'm here. I'm literally inside where the cows are or something like that. So that would be kind of cool. A hundred percent. Our um, farmers often send photos and our pig farmer particularly, and these are the happiest pigs. They have the most wonderful home um, in this lush green pasture. And he just lives for watching and interacting with them and giving them a good life. And so, yes, um, that is definitely something we're going to move into. And in fact, one of the best um, images that we have for wild pastures is a picture of him in suspenders out in the grass with his happy pigs. Uh, And so like you said, some people that message really resonates for, and we're hoping to do more of that and to actually go on the farms and take a lot of footage and just teach people um, and show people exactly like you're saying. Yeah, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Um, what does your current diet look like these days? What are you, what are you eating these days? Yeah. So uh, that kind of depends on the day, but I just do a paleo thing. I, you know, I'm really strategic about getting a protein, animal protein specifically, obviously. And so it's kind of, my day is structured around that, like a really high quality animal product, either two or three times a day, depending on where I'm at in my cycle, um, whether or not I'm fasting. And then I will just eat my lower carb veggies that actually work really, really well for me and the occasional piece of fruit. So I kind of have like a low carb, sometimes ketogenic, high quality animal product uh, diet going. How has that affected your physical capacity? And, you you know, dancing can be very, uh, you know, again, I'm not a dancer, but I mean, it can be very taxing physically as as you're well aware, Uh, better, better, better performance, better strength. And I mean, obviously you're comparing yourself at at a different age category, but What are your thoughts around that? Yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I think I'm a lot stronger than I was when I actually danced because I wasn't eating a lot of meat. But then also for the the keto, low carb end of things, I am APOE4. I have both. And so I have a gene that I don't think carbohydrates work as well for me. I actually feel a lot more tired when I eat too many, Um, but I do it cyclically, cyclically, seasonally, right? Um, A little more carbs in the summer. And then with my cycle, 
fewer carbs in the beginning of my cycle and more at the end. So I'm pretty strategic about it, but I do, I feel a lot better. I'm definitely lifting heavier than I've ever, you know, and I, I just use kettlebells and stuff. It's not like I'm a power lifter, but from a ballerina to where I'm at now, I have a lot more lean muscle mass. I'm a lot stronger. I can form a lot better actually. I just, I've been looking at this the whole time I have to come. I love the way how you've color coded all the books on your shelves. <laughs> oh, isn't that nice? Yeah. Really nice. Now you uh, can see my OCD nature. Yeah, right yeah, I can see that. Yeah. It's kind of, kind of neat, thanks, but thanks. Uh, good yeah. for you. Any, any, uh, so any, anything else you wanted to share about before we've got a few more minutes left. I want to make sure you get anything else out there that you want to share. Gosh, no, I'm just really grateful to connect with your audience and um, grateful for people who care about regenerative agriculture and care about health, despite what mainstream media tells you. So um, kudos to you all. And you can catch up with me, autumn at paleovalley.com. I answer everybody, whoever reaches out, Wild Pastures, um, paleovalley.com, or um, come see us in Boulder at Wild Pastures Burger Company too. All right, I just, you, I just I'm just gonna get you followed on, on what do you call it, Instagram there. So 52,000 followers, good. So you got another one. Um, <laughs> yes. So you, 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 you got those things in there. Um, what else was I going to say? Um, where, uh, are you guys going to any conferences or anything like that? Are you guys represented in major conferences? You know what? Uh, you know, we have some members of our team. They actually have been going to, I think they just went to health con and I think some of them opted to go to paleo effects. Some of them didn't want to, but we were there. I don't know of any upcoming conferences, uh, that we're going to go at or be at, but we did just move homes. And so Chaz and I have kind of been keeping a low profile, but hopefully um, this summer, if there are conferences, um, Ancestral Health Symposium, uh, the Grass-Fed Exchange, I know we've gone to before, even though that was passed, but no, which conferences do you find are the most um, important? Oh, I don't know. I mean, no. that's, I, I don't know that I, my, my, my opinion would make much difference. I'm going to be, I'm, I know I'm speaking to KetoCon this year in Austin, which I like getting back. I went to college at University of Texas, so it's always nice to get back to Austin. I'm actually, it's kind of fun. I'm going to be speaking in front of the U.S. Cattle, not the U.S., California Cattlemen's Association in San Diego at the end of this month. So it's, it's always mm -hmm. funny to me that when I have to go and teach cattle ranchers how healthy meat is, it's just, <laughs> it just makes me laugh. It's just such a ironic situation. So I'm going to go down there and do that and encourage them to keep, keep doing what they're doing and fight the good fight because we need, we need people in this, in this battle. So, well, yeah. I'll tell you what, so you, you'd mentioned, um, so paleo Valley on Instagram, I think that's, is that your guys's major social media place to find you? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm just followed you guys there and thank you so much for what you do. Oh, that's what I, I need to, I need to go. I probably need to hunt down Stefan and interview him again. Cause I'm, I'm super excited to hear about this study. Cause I know Fred Prevenz I've interviewed and I know he's kind of involved in that, in that space, but no one has produced a study that I want to, you know, like say, Hey, here we go. We've got some proof. So it, can, it makes it mean, you know, I, I'm, you know, as much as I talk about people sharing their experiences and I think that's important, but at the end of the day, when you have a study, you can say, Hey, look, this study is going to be, uh, uh, an important, um, thing that we can, we can hang our hat on a little bit. And, and one study is not the end of everything. And, Again, no. biomarkers don't necessarily tell us clinical disease, but we can start to make some make some progress there. Awesome. I'm okay. So All right. Well, it's been wonderful. It's wonderful to meet you and uh, continue the great work. And uh, thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. And the rest of you guys, we'll see you guys back tomorrow on Saturday. If not, have a good weekend. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.